Hey brothers and sisters, once again, I come before you with another message to re-upload from the past. And uh, once again, it's from God's Hero 7. <laughs> All right, I just laid out there like that. Um, it's another connection with a prophetic message that they received around the December 2016 time frame, which ties into something that the Lord has been speaking to me about concerning um, the book of Revelation. Now, I released this message on the 23rd of December 2016, and then a few days later, um, God's Healer 7 released a message titled, Take Heed for the Book of Seven Shall Be Open. And this was released on the 30th of December 2016. It seems like to me at the time that it was a confirmation to what the Lord has already spoken, but I thought I would re-upload the message again to kind of uh, bring a fresh reminder over what the Lord, uh, some of the things that the Lord revealed to me concerning the book of Revelation. And so the overall general concept is that the book of Revelation is all about the feast of Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement fulfilled in heaven. Um, however, comma, there is also the feast that played a role into it. It's like ultimately the feast of the Lord, which I spoke about in previous teachings, broke down the steps that was ultimately leading to the day of atonement which is the redemption of all of creation because remember the holy scripture speaks about how the earth groans for the sun for the manifest sons and daughters to be revealed and how the earth groans for their redemption the earth desired to be redeemed um to be restored and as such depending on what kind of uh, bible translation you read um so in creating this right it's titled day of atonement the plague of nations and the coming of the lord so this speaks about how in the book of Revelation, the feast, how it all plays together, right, to ultimately fulfill Yom Kippur in heaven to bring about the restoration of all things. And so I'm going to once again share the prophetic word that came from God's Healer 7. And then from there, we're going to uh, roll into the next um, to the message, which is once again titled Day of Atonement, the Plague of Nations and the Coming of the Lord, which was produced on the 23rd of December 2016. And which uh, a few days later, I, I'm bad at math. Hold on. Yeah, seven days later. Sorry. Uh, God's Hero 7 created the uh, their message. Take heed for the book of seven is about to be open. And so I believe the book of seven is the scroll. You know, it's the book that Jesus opened, which had the seven seals. So when it says the book of seven, then it seems to me that it refers to that book that was open. So back in the day, right, in the ancient times, whenever, uh, well, let me not get too complicated with this because that is irrelevant, but put it this way, is that if you have a scroll, right an ancient scroll and there's a seal on it which keeps the uh, scroll closed what you would want to do is you pop open the seal and then read the contents of it well does it does it seem like it makes sense right in a book of revelation for the seven seals to be popped open from a scroll but yet the contents of the scroll itself not be read and so this is kind of like an introduction to what we're going to be seeing happening here um, shortly concerning the message. Because uh, what came to Revelation, what came to mind, the mystery that seemed to be revealed to me was in the book of Leviticus. And how the book of Leviticus actually reveals the blueprints where the book with the seven seals is actually the blueprint of salvation. Now remember how I mentioned before that the feast you know, is the, the order of events to take place in heaven uh, before the re uh, restoration of all things take place. But ultimately, everything culminates on Yom Kippur, which is the cleansing, the purification, the removing of transgression, the removing of sin once and for all. So it all led to that moment of Yom Kippur to once redemption takes place for all of mankind, for all of eternity. Then we roll into the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the millennial reign of Christ. And so now I present to you the re-upload of this message from December 2016. And I pray that you will be blessed by the hearing of the message. I love you all. And may God continue to bless you and take care of you in the seasons to come. Oh, and one last thing to note is that when I done this, met, performed this message, created this message through the Lord, it was in December 2016, and that's when I didn't get the full revelation about all seven feasts being observed in heaven.
So when I got that revelation, I created an updated message on it that you saw later on, um, that you saw recently, probably about a week or two ago, in which I completed it um, in that version, etc. Uh, but when I received this December 2016 message, I did not get the full picture yet concerning the fulfillment of the seven feasts in heaven. But over time, the Lord has gave me the understanding because remember, it takes it's a process, you know, learning this stuff is a process in which you must take time and have an open heart with the Lord for correction and refinement. And so as the time as time went on and I spent more time with the Lord, he gave me more clarification and an understanding of the things in Scripture. So once again, when I created this, I did not see the full picture yet of the seven feasts being fulfilled in heaven. The heavenly fulfillment, shall I say, of the seven feasts. Uh, but then later on, I got it. So this is where, where you might see maybe some things that might be off or maybe even contradict. But mind you again that this was on the 23rd of December 2016 when I did not receive the full revelation yet. All right. Love you all. Praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome to the God Solar 7 End Time Prophecy Channel. Uh, Sister Barbara, Brother Dan here. Uh, this is our second one we're putting up, uh, Brother Dan's Prophecy. Um, I'm going to be in the uh, King James Version Study Bible, just because Brother Dan grabbed the wrong one. <laughs> and I can't really do much. But I want to say this first before I start reading the scripture. It's chapter 5, um, Revelation 12, chapter 5. I just want to say this, that Brother Dan and I, we are really getting under the skin of the devil, the enemy trying to stop us. So we must be doing our job. And we will do it until we can't speak anymore, as my stroke showed that, that as soon as I woke up, I got a prophecy. So here we go. I can't take my glasses off so we can find the video. All right. Chapter 12, verse, uh, chap chapter 12, verse 5, starting at 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read this scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose the seven seals. Brother Dan. Okay, um, glad to be here again on God's Healer 7. I got this word on um, December 30th of 2016. And um, just a little background. And um, Barbara always tells me I'm really bad at explaining stuff, yes. so I'm going to uh -oh. try. So basically, when I got this word, I had goosebumps from my head right down to the bottom of my foot. Holy Spirit, God bumps. Yep, and it was so strong. It was like somebody had like one of those tens things on you. <laughs> my whole body was like electrified. So how did I do explaining that? That's very good. That's what it was like. That's when I say I feel like I'm going to fly away. So then after I got this word, for the next 30 minutes, all I heard, you know, sometimes like when you remember when you were younger, you get a song in your head yes. and you keep on hearing it. Well, I kept on hearing the shofar for 30 minutes and I couldn't put it on okay, mute. Okay, should I make that woo? <laughs> that's what it was doing. Okay. Okay, that's enough. So let's okay, get that going. ties with the prophecy I just put up. The shofar yes. will blow a warning blast. Yes, and the shofar was blowing and I could not mute the shofar. <laughs> it was driving me insane and could it finally turn turned off. Turn off the no, and I, then I, I looked outside to see if we were raptured. Cause oh, I no, thought, we're still here. No, and I, it was that strong. I said, well, maybe this is it. All right, so there's the background for this word. Okay, here we go. Uh, it is the breath of life that speaks to thee this day. I am the light. I am the beacon of hope. I am the Alpha and Omega. From the beginning, I am. You stand in front of me in humility. I know thee. The truth does not waver. It speaks to you this day. Evil has tried to silence you. It shall fail. Your eyes are open and you shall see what lies ahead. Come hither. I shall speak in your ear. What I whisper you shall proclaim boldly. My eyes see all, 
and I know what is in men's hearts. Take heed, the book of seven shall be open, for my wrath is kindled, and my will shall be done. Judgment shall replace mercy. You shall bear witness to my glory. Hearken, for in the distance the shofar blows in earnest. Amen. And I got the goosebumps again for that. Now we have two with the shofar. I know my yes. head was standing up the whole time we were reading that. So once again, we know we're in the latter days. Any, any time now, we could be out of here. So uh, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He created by that in Acts 2.38. And I'm announcing the coming of the glorious kingdom and his majesty. I start that September 24th, 2015. I continue on that until April 6th, 2019 in Sackcloth and Ashes. So God only knows what's going to take place or go on in that time frame. So God bless you all. Remember to like us on God's Holy 7 Facebook channel. And praise, praise the Lord. And all right, so welcome all my new friends. Tons of notes that I have for you. <laughs> I hope I don't bore you too much. Uh, beginning at Leviticus chapter 16. Um, and something I want to put out to you guys is that stuff that I want you to remember, I highlighted in red, as you see before you. So the red portions of scripture are like key words or phrases that I want you to remember because they tie in with something later on. And it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, which they offered before the Lord and died. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat which is upon the ark that he die not for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat so right here the Lord is saying that there's only certain times in the year in which Aaron can come in and we already know this to be the day of atonement when he can enter in uh, to the holy of holies to make atonement for the nation verse 3 thus shall uh, Aaron come into the holy place so this is the form and fashion in which Aaron must come and if he does not do it this way he will die and it says, with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. So you have the bullock for a sin offering and a ram for an offering of burning. I didn't highlight that in red. I'm sorry, but I want you to remember that. A ram for a burnt offering. Burnt offering, burnt offering, burnt offering. That's going to be important to remember in the book of Revelation. And it goes on to say in verse 4, he shall... Put on the holy linen coat, and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with the linen mitre shall he be attired. These are holy garments, therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. So now the Lord is telling them that you will come with a ram, and with a bullock, and you will put on the, the high priestly robe, you know, the kingly priestly garments that he was commanded to um, create while uh, they were in the process of building the tabernacle of our most high God. And so the notes that I got here, I'm just reading through it real quick, uh, through it real quick. It says, there were only certain periods in which the high priests were permitted access to the Holy of Holies. This was the Day of Atonement we covered at. The presence of the Lord was marked by his glory cloud, glory cloud, which settled upon the mercy seat. We're going we're gonna to hear about this again in the book of Revelation. Um, note three, the high priest was required to put on the Melchizedek robes, which is the kingly priestly garments. And note four, the high priest was required to bring the sin offering before the Lord and a holy of holies to make atonement for the sins of the nation, as well as a burnt offering. Next, in verse number five, it says, And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel. So you had the Bulic offering, which was for, for his atonement, right? The atonement of the high priest. And a ram offering is a burnt offering. Now, for, for the people of Israel, for the congregation, it says that he, uh, he must take two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. So now we have a so now we have a offering that the high priest must make to atone for himself. And now there's offerings that he must take from the people to make atonement for the people. And so for them would be two goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Burnt offering, burnt offering. Verse number six. And Aaron shall offer his bulic of the sin offering, which is for himself and make an atonement for himself and for his house. That was the purpose of the bulic offering. And he shall take two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So these two goats would be bought at the door of the tabernacle. Another uh, phrase highlighted in red, I want you to remember. 
And verse number eight, it says, And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the coat, the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell, and offer him for a sin offering. So pretty much two goats, one shall be offered as a sin offering to atone for the holy place and for the nation. And another one shall be the scapegoat that shall take the blame for the sins of the nation. So the the lot which fell in uh, towards the Lord, the goat whose lot fell towards the Lord would be killed. While the scapegoat would be alive and cast out from the people. And verse 10 it says, But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Into the wilderness. Remember that. And so running through the notes to make sure I covered everything. The ram was for the atonement of the high priest and his house. The two goats were for the atonement of the nation. The two goats were required to be presented before the door of the tabernacle. One goat would be the sin offering for atonement of the people. The other goat would be cast out the tabernacle, out the city, into the wilderness and bear the sins of the nation. So now let's go to the book of Revelations chapter 4 and see this same parallel happen in heaven. Now remember that this is after the Lord ascended to heaven and Pentecost occurred where there was the outpouring of the Spirit. And in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 it says, After this I looked and behold a door was opened in heaven. Remember the sheep was bought, well the goat was bought before the door of the tabernacle. And so now John has a vision where he sees the door of heaven open. And the, verse four, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me but said come up hither and i will show the things which must be hereafter so now what is so important for us to hone in on in verse number one is that john is taken to heaven right to be to, to witness the feast of atonement take place in heaven because pentecost has already come the outpouring of the holy spirit has already come and so now John is taken to heaven and he is going to be shown the Feast of Atonement taking place. So he's brought to the door, right? And in verse number two it says, And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on a throne. So this right here is saying that John was taken through the door and is now presented in the Holy of Holies in heaven where the mercy seat of God is and which God is sitting upon the throne. And in verse four it says, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white and uh, white raiment, and they had on their heads crown of gold. These are the priestly kings, the elders that stand, that sits before the Lord of the earth. And verse five it says, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of god now the reason why i highlighted this in, in uh, red is because the number seven is mentioned here you're going to see the importance of the number seven in a new way that we never understood it before because we know that the number seven represents completion right they say it's perfection is completion so we're going to see the understanding and the representation of the number seven in a new spiritual dynamic than we have ever seen before because it's the Lord that's going to lead you on his journey to understand it. Not me. I'm just a man of flesh, but the Lord's going to lead you to understand something in which he revealed to me. And so now the notes that I put here before we continue on <clears throat> to make sure I tied up all loose ends. John was brought before the door of the tabernacle in heaven. He was in the Holy of Holies where the mercy seat of God was. There were 24 priestly kings, high priests, that ministered before the Lord. Uh, note number three also is that the menorah was there as well. The seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, and the, which are the seven spirits of God. So that means that there was a menorah in heaven. And the reason why I annotate that in there is to let you know that, remember, the menorah was actually brought inside the was located in the temple of God, inside the temple of God. And then beyond that is the Holy of Holies where the mercy seat of God is. So this is to bring to your understanding that John was brought into the Holy of Holies. Now we know in the Old Testament 
that the high priest was not permitted to go into the Holy of Holies any time in a way that he pleased. But there was a certain way he had to bring the sin offering and the burnt offering into the Holy of Holies for the purpose of atonement. And so now since John was brought into the Holy of Holies of God, he's, the Lord is saying that I am about to allow you to see the atonement of nations take place through the Lamb of God. Now, moving on in Revelation chapter 5. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book, written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. So there's a book in the hand of God, and there's seven seals on it. And I saw a, a strong angel pro proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Now, what is this book? If we are in the Holy of Holies and atonement is to take place for the people, what would the high priest have with him to make sure that he carries out the process of atonement once he entered in? Because the high priest does not have the stuff memorized. And if he does, it would be a precaution for him to have something with him to make sure he does it right. He would have the instructions of God. So the high priest would have in the Holy of Holies the instructions as to what he needs to do to make sure that it is done perfectly. And so why is this so? It's because if he made one little mistake, it would cost him his very life. So his life depended on his ability to follow the instructions of atonement perfectly, especially since it's done once a year. So he understood the, the, the instruction. He had the book with him. Okay, not to say that the Lord was under the same kind of, um, you know, measurement, not at all, because our Lord is perfect. He was going to be one for one every time because he's a perfect guy. But for man, they would need to have the, the book there. And so now this book that is in the hand of God is the actual instructions of atonement. The instructions that is to be carried out to make atonement for all of creation once and for all. And the question is, who is worthy to open the book and to loose seals thereof? In Israel, not everybody was worthy to carry out the plan of atonement. Only the high priest was the only person, the one sole person who was permitted to enter into the Holy of Holies and carry it out. If anyone else would dare to try to do that same thing, they would die instantly. They would even stand a chance. It was only the high priest. And so in book of Revelation, remember how it says that there was no one on heaven or on earth or under the earth that was found worthy. There was no high priest that was found worthy to carry out the instructions of atonement. And so he wept. And then we move on to verse number five. It says, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And behold, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain. Remember, two goats was bought before the door of the tabernacle. One was to be a scapegoat, the other one was to be a sin offering. So look who actually is presented as the sin offering to make atonement. Our Lord, as for it says, the uh, lamb as it had been slain and having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Jesus Christ was the only person who is worthy to be the high priest, to loose the seals and to begin to fulfill the process of atonement for all mankind. And the notes that I have here, <clears throat> is uh, I want to make sure that I covered everything. In Leviticus 16, the priest was required to bring two goats before the door of the tabernacle for a sin offering. Jesus was the lot that fell as a sin offering to make atonement for the nation. So therefore, he was the goat that was brought before the Lord to make atonement. In Leviticus 16, it says, in verse 8, it says, And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. This is why it was a lamb, lamb as if it was slain that entered into the Holy of Holies. Note number two. 
The book contained the instructions of God to make complete atonement for sin once and for all. Jesus is the only worthy high priest that can open the book and carry out the instructions for atonement in the same way that a high priest of Israel would have the ordinance of God to make atonement once a year. Note number three, because he, because the high priest of Israel was a sinner, he needed to make atonement for himself. That's why there was the Bulik offering. All right. And so because Jesus is sinless, there was no need of a type of Bulik offering in heaven. There's only the goat offering. And so now we want to go to Hebrews chapter seven to read the declaration of who the Lord has become for us in heaven because he was the only one worthy to open a scroll and release its seven seals and he is the only one who is worthy to stand as high priest and verse 17 it says for he testifieth thou art a priest forever after the order melchizedek for there is verily a disannulling of the commandments going before for the weakness and unprofit unprofitableness thereof for the law made nothing perfect right but the bringing in of a better hope did, by which we draw nigh unto God, that is in our Lord Jesus Christ, and the covenant in which he made. And in as much as not without an oath, he was made priest. For those were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, which mean unchanging in his mind about this, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death, which means that there were many high priests that came upon the earth ministering in the temple because of the fact that they did not live forever, but once they died, there had to be a changing of the guard. Verse 24, But this man, because he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able to also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. And so this right here is telling us the reason why there was no reason for a Bulic offering for the Lord, because he was perfect in every way. Verse 27, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice to Bulic offering, first for his own sins, and then for the people's, for, he, for this he did once when he offered up himself as that goat offering, that sin offering. The one in which is to make atonement for us all. Moving on to verse number 11 in Leviticus 16. And Aaron shall bring the bulic of the sin offering, which is for himself. <laughs> we just spoke about this, right? Aaron had to atone for his own sins. The high priest had to atone for their own sins. But Jesus Christ did not. And shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bulic of the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord and its hands full of sweet incense beaten small and bring it within the veil and he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he died not so where have we heard this before censer full of burning coals of fire doesn't that sound like the book of Revelation with the angel that had a golden censer? Because it is. It's the parallel version of it. It's the continued process of the Feast of Atonement. But here we see that it was only one person who did it, right? Uh, it was only the high priest. But in heaven, the Lord has a team of priests that he uses to get the job done. So while on planet Earth, there's only one high priest. In heaven, the Lord has a team. And that team is qualified to help him and carry out the, these plans. And his team is manifested through the seven angels with the seven trumpets and the seven angels with the bowl judgments and the angel that is before the altar of God. All right, so reading the notes here, it says the high priest was required to burn incense before the Lord with coals of fire from the altar and present it with incense before the mercy seat of God. This was to receive mercy from God and not die. This is going to be important now because now we're going to understand the purpose of the censor and the book of Revelation. Because these censors is offered to God so that he would not die, so that he would find mercy at the mercy seat of God. And so before we touch the parallel between the angel that is before the altar of God offering the uh, and offering incense to the Lord uh, with the golden censer, 
that parallels to what we just read that the high priest is doing when he's offering incense before God with his censer. Before we move into that realm, we need to go back and establish the groundwork of the seven seals. What was the purpose of the seven seals? Because during the time of the seventh, the seventh seal is when the angel of heaven parallels what we just read in Leviticus chapter 16 with the censer. The purpose of the book, as we already know, it was to uh, it was the blueprints of the atonement process that our Lord will carry out to atone for all of heaven and earth because of transgression from Lucifer from the time of Lucifer and forevermore. Um, and so, in releasing the seals, which each seal represents, it represents the condition of mankind. It represents the condition of the earth. And it represents the persecution of the saints of God. So what the six seals is doing is that it is bringing all sins into light. It is bringing all transgression into the light. It's pulling what was hidden in the darkness and made manifest in the forefront. This is what the seals are doing. Because why a person would say, why would we need atonement when there's nothing wrong? There's nothing that we have done wrong. It is not until a person comes to understand their condition the sinful condition that they're in, the depraved, the corrupted conditioner that they're in, it's not until they get to that position that they realize a need to have their sins atoned for. And a way that, and so once they come to the realization of their sinful nature, then they understand the power of atonement. So before the Lord could carry out the atonement process for heaven and earth, mankind must first understand the reality of the conditions that they are in. So with every seal that's being pulled the way that is being removed from the book which contains the instruction of atonement is a, is a seal exposing what is in the darkness and bringing it out to the light and so the first seal right has the white horse and so this white horse was given a bow and a crown it was given forth to him to go and conquer and um, for conquering and to conquer that means that this horse is bringing the condition of warfare that is evident in the lives of mankind since the beginning of history. The second one, the second seal, was a red horse which took peace away from the earth. And so with the removal of peace from the earth, it shows, it brings to light and make it evident and known to all the heartlessness, the murdering spirits that we have towards one another, the killing, um, the senseless violence that we see in our streets and our neighborhoods and how it has always been there because of sin for so long. So it brings people to understanding that our nation is in trouble, our world is in trouble because of the constant warfare. Our world is deprived because of the constant warfare of nation against nation and slaughter from many ill-gotten gain. And how the world is in such terrible condition because we are people who do not love one another and yet we murder and kill each other. And then next we have the third seal which is the black horse. And the black horse speaks about the famine in the land. It speaks about how we have, how because of the blood of the innocents, how because so much blood has been soaked into the ground, because of how our sins corrupted the ground, the ground no longer brings forth its harvest. It no longer brings forth its, uh, forth its fruits, its food for the people. Because the ground has been cursed, because we have cursed it with our sins. We have cursed it with our abominations. And so now the ground is no longer to yield its fruits because it is sick from all of our perversion and the fourth and the fourth seal speaks about the pale horse and a pale horse speaks about how because of the sinful corruption of the earth how all of creation becomes corrupt how everything is now corrupt how now the very gates of hell has opened its mouth against the earth and of all creation it speaks about how people kill each other with the sword it speaks about how there is hunger and famine in so many different places. It speaks about how even the beast have become corrupted because of the sins and the iniquity and the darkness that we've played the world because of all unrighteousness. Then it speaks about the fifth seal. How those who stand for God, how those who walk in a ways of righteousness and seek to please God are martyred. They're persecuted. How this world has become such a dark place that if you try to live according to the light, if you try to live according with the word of God, with the will of God and seek the kingdom purposes, how you are marked as an enemy of this earth and how this earth has been consumed by the very bowels of hell itself. And it speaks about how those who resisted the world and sought after God how in their persecution the Lord is saying that 
that they need to hold on just a little longer because vengeance is sure to come. But first, the world must see the condition that it is in. They must see the corruptedness, how far they have fallen from my perfect design. And so the Lord rewards them and he gives them white robes, which shows that they have been purified by his blood and that they can come that they're going to come into their season of peace and prosperity and joy forevermore then after the world is shown for the mess that it is in because they have fallen away from the perfect design of god they have rejected our lord jesus christ in the plan of salvation that he has created for all mankind he opens the sixth seal and what the sixth seal does it puts an end and a complete stop to the entire world's affair everything is thrown out of whack everything is put at a standstill a great shifting has taken place and the way that things used to be will no longer be now it is time for the lord to, to show the world that enough is enough now is the time for judgments to be rendered and atonement to be made and this is why when we look at verse 16, it says, Fall on us and hide from us from the face of him that sitteth on a throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And I want you to remember verse number 17. It says, For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And who shall be able to stand? This here is a reference out of Luke chapter 21 that we're going to mention later. And so now we could bridge the parallel between what we just read in Leviticus chapter 16 with um, Revelation chapter 8. And Revelation chapter 8, it says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So we have the number seven here right now. Remember we spoke about how seven... Uh, reflects uh, completion, perfection, and the such. So it's already setting the baseline of what we're going to see the significance of the number seven as it pertains to the um, Day of Atonement. In verse three, and another angel. So this is this is an eighth angel apart from the seven angels with the trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar in the same way that the priest in Leviticus stood at the inner altar, the altar of incense. And it says that this, this angel having a golden censer and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Now, the, sense, the incense that the angel is offering before God contains the prayers of the people. So what exactly are the people praying about? The way that we find the answer to this is by going back to Leviticus and find out why the high priest offered the censer to the mercy seat of God to begin with. And when we go to Leviticus chapter 16, verse number 13, it says, And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony, that he die not. So when the high priest offered the, the incense before the mercy seat of God is so that God will have mercy upon him and that he would not fall into God's judgment. So now we see that the angel during the time of the seventh seal is offering the prayers of the saints before the mercy seat of God because the saints have just witnessed the effect of the sixth seal how the lord has put a enough is enough how the lord is now stepping in and he shook heaven and earth now there's an all stop and now it is time for the wrath of god to be made manifest and to punish sin and so now the prayers which is going before the people before the saints well i'm sorry the prayer that is going before god which is in the form of the incense in which the angel is carrying in a sense of before god is the prayers of the saints that the Lord will have mercy upon them during the time of judgment, which shall be rendered beginning with the seven angels, with the seven trumpet judgments. And so how do we, how can we add more additional scripture to this to give more thorough understanding? Uh, we'll find that out shortly. But let's finish uh, the scripture here first. And where did I leave off? Okay, so I believe it was verse number five. Yep. And the angel took the censer 
and filled it with fire of the altar in the same way that the priest in Leviticus uh, 16 did, and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. So now the prayers of the saints who are um, pleading with God, fasting and begging the Lord to have mercy upon them, that they'll be worthy to escape all these things that is to come. This censor is God's answer to prayer. So when the angel sends this fire, right? The angel sends this fire to the earth. That fire is for the people of God. So there is a blessed hope. And, and when we see that sign in the sky from the Lord, is that this fiery, this fiery censer, in whatever form that it will be, it will be for the people of God and answer to prayer that they shall have a great escape once they see this sign of fire. So it, it is a sign of hope from God that he has heard our prayers. Amen. All right. So now we're going to go to verse number 13. And this is actually from a different chapter. I'm sorry that I didn't put the chapter in there, but it's still from the book of Revelation. And it speaks about when, I believe it might still be in the same chapter. I just put dot, 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 and continued on um, for the purpose of brevity. And it says, These six angels sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar. All right, so this is the altar of incense in which the angel, angel is presenting incense before God. Uh, saying to the sixth angel which had the seventh trumpet loose the four angels which are bound in a great river Euphrates so the reason why I add that in there is to bring more clarification that there is an angel that is still operating from that altar of incense and giving instruction and so the four angels which are being loose from the great river Euphrates right is also is represents the four horns of the altar of God in heaven and so since we know that these four angels are coming from the great river Euphrates we are giving uh, <clears throat> a GPS location as to where we need to have our focus to when these judgments begin to fall. So we must look to the east, right? Like to the eastern part of the world, the Middle East, for these signs to take place. So it is so it is very interesting how he says that there are at the Great River Euphrates. That is the, the ground zero. That is where we need to have our, our GPS's caliber too. When we begin to see the signs of the fire of God, which is the hope of the people of God answering the prayers of the people to deliver them, right? Is that there's going to be a fire from the east. So we must look to the east for the uh, fiery arrow or whatever form of this, this sensor presents itself to the people. And the notes that I put here to make sure I wrap all loose ends is that the high priest in Leviticus 16 presented the incense before God to find mercy at his mercy seat and that he would not fall under God's judgment and die. The incense revelation represents the prayers of the saints seeking mercy from God that he will spare them from his fiery judgment. Prayer is the key to find mercy and escape God's judgment during the blowing of the seven trumpet judgments. And with that understanding, when we go to uh, Luke chapter 21, it brings more revelation to what the Lord was speaking about. We are all, well, not all, but many of us are familiar with uh, Luke chapter 21, speaking about the signs of the end times, how there will be, the moon will turn to blood, how the sun will give its light, and how this is going to be a time of great distress. So it seems like that if we really take it on board, the, the Lord was describing um, what is to occur during the time of the sixth seal. And so, without reading throughout uh, through the whole chapter, but highlighting on the key pieces here, um, in verse 21 it says, Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. Because in verse 22 it says, For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. And then when we go back to Revelation chapter 6, and we read verse 16 again. It says, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on a throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Continue to remember the word stand that I mentioned earlier. Who shall be able to stand? So the Lord is saying that when this begins to happen and all these upheaval, it is the great day of vengeance. It is the great day of the sixth seal to put an all stop to the affairs of mankind and for atonements and judgments to be made. Then we go to verse number 23 it says, But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people, as we just read in Revelation chapter 6, right, with the seals. 
And in verse 36, it says the important thing, two important things which reflects what the saints were, were praying about uh, in regards to what the angel with the censer was offering the incense before God, which represents the prayers of the people. Hope I didn't confuse you with that. But it says, watch ye therefore and pray. So when you pray, the angel with the golden censer, with the incense to offer, which is the prayers of the people, will reach the mercy seat of God. It says, pray always that ye may be counted worthy to escape. So that is our escape. All these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the son of man. Because remember how the scripture says, For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And the Lord is saying that now, understand that when this time comes, get into your prayer closet. And as a matter of fact, we should be praying now. But the Lord is saying that that would be the time to really press in even deeper into your prayer closet so that you shall be able to stand before the Son of Man. And now we're moving on to Leviticus chapter 16 verse 14 where we're touching on what the atoning blood of the sin offering uh, was to be used for inside to make atonement for the holy place. Verse 14 says, And he shall take of the blood of the Bulek and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. See, the mercy seat. So he was not to sprinkle it upon the mercy seat, but he were also to sprinkle it eastward, looking to the east. Remember the great U river Euphrates, the fiery sign of uh, the censer from heaven. Sprinkle the blood eastward and before the mercy seat shall be shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times, seven times, seven trumpets. And then when we look at the note here to make sure I wrap it up, it says the high priest was required to sprinkle the blood eastward of the mercy seat seven times with the blood of the Bulek to make atonement for himself and his house. So he was supposed to sprinkle it eastward and also according to scripture in front of it seven times. And now we're going to look at the, the parallel to this with the seven trumpets. Because remember, in Leviticus 16, when the, what was being sprinkled eastward in front of the mercy seat seven times was the blood. The blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood of the Bulek, the blood of the sin offering. The reason I keep saying blood, blood, blood is because when we begin to look at the seven trumpets, which represents the seven sprinkling of the blood, you will see how there is a parallel to what the Lord was signifying here. And so in Revelations going from 8 through 11, I'm not going to read all of it, but touch, but just highlight on the important aspect of it. It says in verse 7, the first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. Hail and fire mingled with blood, the plague of nations. This is the same plague that we saw in the book of Exodus. So now there's the first sprinkling of the finger, the first blowing of the trumpet, and there will be hail, fire, mingled with blood. And remember how I told you to remember the ram, the burnt offering, the burnt offering, the burnt offering earlier in the study, how the ram was presented as a burnt offering. And so the way you burn something is with fire. We're seeing two things happening at once here. There was the burnt offering, which was offered to God, the ram offering, and we're seeing the sin offering of blood. So now it says the first angel sounded and hail and fire, the burnt offering, mingled with blood, the plague of nations. And they were cast upon the earth and the third part of the trees were burnt up. And all green grass was burnt up, the burnt offering. And the second angel, when he sounded, there was a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And then there was the third part of the sea, which what happened? Became blood. So now we have the, the burnt offering and the blood, the sprinkling of the blood. And it says that the per third part of the tr creatures which were in the sea died. Um, and the ship third part were destroyed. Going to verse number 10, it says, and the, and the third angel sounded. And there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. Now remember how there are seven spirits before God, how there's the menorah, there's the lamp of God uh, that was in there. So there's still a tie-in where the Lord is pulling the, the lights, the seven lights of God, the seven spirits of God, the menorah that was found in Leviticus 16. 
is being <clears throat> reflected here even so. And it says there's a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp. All right, the candlesticks, the lamp, the candlesticks, the menorah. And it fell upon a third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of the waters. And the name of the star is Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. So now we know that when this star happened, right, this light, this torch, this menorah, uh, which I, I'm telling you, there's so much mysteries inside here. I'm just trying to bring little tidbits to the forefront. It says that when this happened, the water shall become bitter. But how could what would be the condition of the water? Like what would the water look like, which would cause it to be bitter and unable to drink? To find out the answer to this, we also go back to Exodus chapter seven. And in seven, it says, and Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded, and he lifted up the rod and smote the waters that were in the river. So he had a rod right where he smoked the waters and i remember how it says that there was a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp and it fell upon the water so in the same way that this star fell upon the water go to exodus chapter 7 it's the same way that this rod of moses fell upon the waters of egypt and it says lifted up the rod and smote the waters that were in the river in the sight of pharaoh and in the sight of his servants and all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood wormwood and a fish that was in the river died and the river stank and egyptians could not drink of the water of the river and there was blood throughout all the land of egypt so when this wormwood star falls it would be in parallel to when moses struck the waters of the river nile and it turned to blood so once again we see the sprinkling of the blood right the blowing of the trumpet the sprinkling of the blood of the high priest in leviticus chapter 16. Now, in the sounding of the fourth trumpet, it says that the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. I will be honest with you, I did not get any revelation from this one. No, didn't get any revelation. If if uh, anyone listening to this see a parallel there to how it relates to the Leviticus 16 movement, let me know. But I did not receive any <laughs> revelation for the fourth angel. Uh, but then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star again fell from heaven unto the earth and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit and he opened the bottomless pit and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace burnt offering again remember how in Leviticus there was the ram of the burnt offering more parallels and then in verse 4 it says and it was um, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth neither any green thing neither any tree but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Remember the saints that was praying for a way of escape and that they shall be spared from the judgment of God. So when so that fiery arrow that that answer to prayer came in the form of God's people being marked with the seal of God so that they shall be protected in the time of the calamities. And the highlights I want you to take from here is in verse number 12. And it says, Woe, one woe is past, and behold, there are two woes more hereafter. And it speaks about the sixth angel. And it says that when the sixth angel sounded, which is the sixth sprinkling of blood, right, in Leviticus chapter um, 16, it says, And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. So we already spoke about the angel, the eighth angel, which stood before the altar of God, and how he plays a role in this. And it says, so after the sixth sprinkling of blood or the blowing of the six trumpets, just laying out a parallel, this is what happens next. It speaks about the four angels, right? That is at the great river Euphrates. And then when we go to verse 17, it describes what they look like. It says that they had breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouth issued fire and smoke and brimstone. So what are we referring to here again? Burnt offering. Blood and fire. Pillow, um, pillows of smoke. Burnt offering. All part of the atonement process. Where you offer the goat, you offer the bulik, and you offer the ram. 
And so the notes that I have here to sum it all together, it says the seven angels with the seven trumpets is in parallel to the high priest sprinkling the blood eastward of the mercy seat seven times. The seven trumpets is part of the cleansing process to purify the earth. We must look to the east of Jerusalem for the signs of the seven trumpets and the fiery censer. So not only to the east, but remember how that he was required to sprinkle it to the east and also before the mercy seat. So it's not to the northeast that we're looking at. It's not directly east, but in the southern eastern part of the world. Because in Leviticus 16, he was required to do the process seven times where he sprinkled it eastward of the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. Eastward of the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. He did it seven times. So the Lord is telling you that the direction, that the portion where the judgment shall be coming down upon will be in the southern eastern part of the world the southern eastern part which encompasses the middle east and africa that is going to be the focal point when many of these things begin to happen and so at the completion of the seven trumpets slash sprinkling of blood at the mercy seat atonement is made for the inner temple and the inner temple of heaven is purified and so now when we touch bases with the with uh, Leviticus uh, 16, what was being described there was what the Bulik was used for, is that the Bulik in Leviticus 16, we're talking about Old Testament only here, um, is that it was for the, the atonement to be made for the priest and his house because the priest was not a person who did not have sin, he was a sinner. But now when we move forward, it speaks about the goats, which is the sin offering. And with the goat of the sin offering, um, the priest was required to do the exact same thing that he did with the Bulik for the people. And so we know that the goat of the sin offering represents our Lord Jesus Christ, who made atonement for the people. Because the Lord did not have to make atonement for himself, for there's no need of a Bulik. But there's only the need of a sin offering from the goat as the offering. And so in Leviticus 15, it says, Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering, that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with the blood as he did with the blood of the bulik. So the exact same process that he did with the bulik, he would do with the goat of the sin offering. And it says, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seats and before this um, and before the mercy seats. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. So it was the children of Israel that made the holy place unclean. And because of their transgression and all their sins, and so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. So the notes that I put here is that the blood from the goats was used to atone for the people and a tabernacle because of sin. Once the process was complete after the seventh sprinkling of blood, the tabernacle of God is then purified from all uncleanness which was tainted because of the transgression of the people. Now this is inside the temple. And now we are at Revelation chapter 11, beginning verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded. So this is the seventh sprinkling to complete the purification process. And there was and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever and the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God saying we give we give thee thanks O Lord God Almighty which art and was and art to come because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned and the nations were angry and, the, and thy wrath is come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets and to the saints and them that fear thy name small and great and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth and the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testimony. And there were lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and earthquake, and a great hail. So now the seventh trumpet has sounded. The seventh sprinkling of Leviticus 16 has been completed for the Bulik offering for the priests and the sin offering for the people. It is complete. Purification is done. The inner courts of God's house has been clean and purified. Now there is a declaration that is being made here in Revelation 11, stating that atonement has been made. Now it's time for the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the notes that I put here is note number one. 
The seventh trumpet is in parallel to the seventh sprinkling of the blood which purifies the tabernacle of God in heaven. After the seventh trumpet, heaven is purified once more from the contamination of Satan and his fallen angels. That's the mystery there. That's why heaven had to be purified because remember Satan brought sin into the sanctuary when he rebelled and caused the other fallen angels to rebel with him. And so heaven is atoned for. And so now we're at Leviticus chapter 16, verse 17. And it says, There shall be no man in the tabernacle of a congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out, and hath made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. So pretty much the priest, the high priest, was the only person who was permitted to be inside the tabernacle during the day of atonement. No one else was permitted to go in there until the until atonement has been made with the bulic offering for the high priest because he is with sin and also with the goat offering, which is for the people. So once he completed this process in full, then they was able to permitted to go in there until that time. They were not permitted to enter in. And in verse 18, it says, And he shall go out onto the altar that is before the Lord, and make an atonement for it, and it shall take of the blood of the bulic and of the blood of the goat, and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven times, and cleanse it, and hollow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. So after he is done with the process before the mercy seat of God, he is then required to go before the altar of God. And so once he is before the altar of God, that is where he must go and finish the cleansing process where he takes the bulic, which is the sin offering for the priest and the goat and a goat, which is the uh, sin offering um, for the people. And then before that altar, that same altar where when we parallel it to heaven, the angel is standing before and he must now make atonement for that. And the notes that I put here to make sure I cover all the angle is that no one was permitted in the tabernacle while the high priest was making atonement for the nation. Once he has completed the task completely, then people can enter into the tabernacle of God once more because atonement was made for the temple and the people. Complete atonement was not made until both the sin offering and scapegoat was offered accordingly. And after the high priest made atonement for the tabernacle, he was required to go out of the temple and make atonement for the, well not out of the temple, but away from the Holy of Holies before the mercy seat of God and before the altar that was before the Lord um, and make atonement at the altar because of the transgression of the people. The priest was also required to sprinkle the altar seven times with blood of the goat and the bulic. The congregation of Israel would be standing way outside in the courtyard of the tabernacle waiting for atonements to be completed by the high priest. And with that being said, and understanding the concept um, there as to what the responsibility of the high priest even before the altar of God to sprinkle an additional seven times because there were seven times to the mercy seat. Now there is an additional seven times to the altar of God where the blood offering was received, right? Because remember, there was two altars. There was the altar of the burnt offering, which is outside, right? Uh, the right before the door of the tabernacle. And then there was the altar where the blood offering was made, and that was before the mercy seat of God. And so what we're speaking of here is before the mercy seat of God. Um, and when we go to Revelation chapter 15, it says, and I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Now there were seven angels, so we already had seven angels with the trumpets. Now you have these seven angels having the seven last plagues, the plague of nations, the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God, and they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, uh, thou King of saints, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name. For thou only art holy, for all the nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. So the judgments were poured out through the seven angels. And now <clears throat> we are seeing 
something else that's about to take place that now there are seven angels that have the seven plates so there was the judgments and now comes the sentencing the seven plagues which is in parallel to the priests with sprinkling the blood over the altar of god seven times and now in verse 5 it says and after that i looked and behold the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open and the seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen and having their breasts girded with golden girdles these are angelic priests which serve before God. And of the four bees gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. That is the parallel we just saw the lord speak in leviticus chapter 16. and so the notes that i have here in the tabernacle of heaven the seven angels with the vial is in parallel to the seven sprinkling of the high priest that he must do to purify the altar of god right the altar that received the blood offering and that in heaven no one will be permitted in until the seven vials or sprinkling right leviticus 16 is poured forth and atonement is made outside onto the altar of god the seven trumpets atone for the inner parts of God's tabernacle, right before the mercy seat. And the seven vials atones for the altar which receives the blood offering. This is in parallel to the high priest of Leviticus 16 sprinkling the blood seven times inside on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies and then outside the Holy of Holies onto the altar which received the blood offering. In heaven there is a sea of people standing outside the tabernacle in the same way the people of Israel sit outside the tab tabernacle on earth waiting for the process to be done. And the last point I want to make for that is that once all the seven plagues, the seven bowls which represents the seven sprinkling of the blood on the altar, at the time of the seventh last plague, this is when the plague of nations for we I mentioned the plague of nations before, but that's only the beginning of it. But this is truly the plague of nations that has to come upon the entire earth. And it is in a time of the seventh angel pouring out his bowl. And it says in Revelation chapter 16, verse 17. And a seventh angel poured out his vial into the air and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne. This is from God now saying it is done atonement has been made for the altar it is finished and there were voices and thunders and lightnings and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great and the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and great babylon came in remembrance before god to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath and every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail, the plague of nations, out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceedingly great. And now Leviticus 16 verse 20 says, And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place, and a tabernacle of a congregation and the altar he shall bring the live goat now we're talking about the scapegoat and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgression and all their sins putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness and a goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited and he shall let go and he shall let go the goat into the wilderness so the notes here after the goat of the sin offering was used to make atonement for the house of god and all of israel the scapegoat was brought forth all of the blame that the people of Israel committed is now put upon the scapegoat to bear the responsibility of the transgression. 
Now that all of the sins of the nation was placed upon the scapegoat, the scapegoat must be cast out from the congregation, which has been purified, and into the wilderness. And so the hire of a fit man, a strong man, who was able to handle the job was needed for the task because the goat would tend to try to make its way back to the congregation, which means that this goat would put up a fight to try to make its way back in. So it would take a strong man to contend with the scapegoat to keep the goat out and cast into the wilderness. The scapegoat was sent into a desolate place to bear the iniquity of the people. So now let's talk about Satan real quick. Let's go to the book of Job chapter 1. Uh, it says here, And there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro, or fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is no man like him in all the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God, and is escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for nothing? Has not thou made a hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he has on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thy hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And so now the notes that I have here, Satan contaminated heaven because of his sin against the Lord. He has led other angels to rebel against God, and so as a result, God's holy tabernacle in heaven became unclean because of the transgression of Satan and the fallen. In the same way how the tabernacle of God on earth became unclean because of the transgression of the people of Israel. So even after Satan's fall, he still had a level of access to God and his very throne room to accuse mankind. So even though that um, the people of Israel would eventually fall back into sin because we were not perfect, right? They would still have access to the temple grounds until the day where atonement had to be made again on another year. So it's not like that the people of Israel sinned and then they were cut off from ever entering in. But they were unclean, but even through the course of time, they would still be required to come forth to bring forth their offerings. And even the priests will come forth to bring forth their offerings, even though that they would, st would be unclean eventually because of sin. Next, we will look at Zechariah chapter 3, and it says, And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. Right? So this is a high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. And Satan standing by at his right hand to resist him. So now you have a high priest who ministers before the Lord, right? And now there's an angel of the Lord, so they're in the courts of God. And guess who's there? Satan again. He still has access into the holy place of God. And it says in verse 2, And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? So the note that I put here, Satan was once again spotted in the heavenly courts, accusing the people of God. He continued to have access to the heavenly courts because God's tabernacle was not yet atoned from the transgression brought forth by Satan's rebellion. And then in 2 Chronicles chapter 18, it says, beginning verse 18 again he said therefore hear the word of the lord this is the prophet of god that was speaking before the king at the time and so the king was inquiring about what was the right thing to do as far as going to war against this warring tribe from the north i cannot remember all the details but this is what the prophet is speaking about what he, the lord has said concerning his situation and it says therefore hear the word of the lord i saw the lord sitting upon his throne so now uh, the prophet sees the Lord in heaven in the Holy of Holies and all the hosts of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who shall entice Ahab, king of Israel, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And once back saying after this manner and another saying after that manner, then there came out a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, Thou shalt entice him, and thou shalt also prevail. Go out and do even so. 
Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil against thee. The notes here. In this example, we see that an evil spirit had access to the very holy place of heaven where God had his throne and his spirit was there to accuse God's people. The reason why the Lord permitted these dark spirits access to the throne room is because they would be used for God's purpose to bring wicked mankind back to reconciliation with him. On the day atonement is fully made for heaven and earth, for all this transgression that has happened since the beginning of time, through the cleansing blood of the Lamb of God, these demons will cease to have any more purpose in God's plan to reconcile all the creation back to him. They will be judged and sentenced. And so bringing our attention back to the scapegoat, looking at it in Leviticus chapter 16, to bring back the specific scripture to memory, it says that with the scapegoat, they shall confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgression and all their sins and putting them upon the head of the goat. And then afterwards, there would be a fit man that shall cast it into the wilderness. And so when we parallel this to Satan, for example, let's go to Genesis chapter 3. And it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So there's a reference that the head of the serpent shall be bruised for the iniquity that it brought forth. Um, in the same way how the priest put the hands on a scapegoat and confess all the sins of the nation, all the sins of the people upon a scapegoat, so the goat will bear it upon its head. And when we go to Genesis chapter 3 again, it says, It shall bruise thy head, which means thy head shall carry the iniquities of the nation. This is being put on the promise, the fulfillment that is being put on Satan. Uh, or that is being put on Satan, that he shall bear the iniquity of the nation because of his own transgression against the people of God, and of even the very throne room of God. And in Psalm 74, it says, Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. This speaks of the Lord. And it says, Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the water. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces. And what happened to the scapegoat? It was cast out into the wilderness by a fit, by a fit man. And what does it say here about Leviathan? And gave us him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. And now we're going to see this very exact same parallel of Satan being the scapegoat to bear the iniquity of all that has happened in creation, all because of him being the originator of which all this came forth. So all the responsibility in which the scapegoat bear for the sins of the nation, now Satan will bear the responsibility for all the sins that has ever occurred since the beginning of nation because of his rebellion being the father of this of sin. And when we go to Revelation chapter 12, it says, And there was war in heaven. Michael, the fit man that was spoken of in Leviticus, right? The fit man to take the scapegoat out because the scapegoat will fight to try to make his way back in. So there was war in heaven where Michael, the fit man, and his angels fought against the dragon, which is the scapegoat. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. The scapegoat was not able to enter back in into the compounds of God's territory. And it says, neither was there a place found any more in heaven. In the same way, there's no place for the scapegoat to be found any more in the congregation of Israel. And a great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, into the wilderness, and his angels was cast out with them. So the devil has no more place into the compounds of God, but was cast out to, to the earth realm, will be cast out to the earth realm, to where he will wait for his final sentencing and brought into the desolate places of hell itself. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down. Right, He's taken into the wilderness, which accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. This is the reference of Leviticus 16, the goat of the sin offering. And by the word of their testimony, this is the atonement that was made with the blood at the mercy seat of God. 
and they love not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And so it says to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has no more place in the heavens. He is now cast down to be into the wilderness of the earth and the sea. And I remember how in Solomon's, or what we just read in, a, in the book of Solomon's, how it says that the Lord breaketh the heads of Leviathan, the heads of the dragon, because this is where the dragon now has his dominion bearing the iniquities of the nation and of all the earth. And in Revelations chapter 13, it continues to speak about how when the beast is cast down onto the earth and the sea, and how the same beast rising up out of the sea, having many crowns upon its head, and how one of the head had a wound as if it was mortally wounded, but recovered. So this is still a reference to the casting down of Satan, which now has to stay here in the wilderness, where he has no power, no authority, but is desperate to try to bring as much wrath upon a nation as possible, because now his time is short. Because once atonement is made it is over he will have his place in the very bowels of the desolate places of hell and a note that I have here is as in Leviticus 16 there was the goat of the sin offering to atone for the house of God in a nation Jesus was the lamb which became a sin offering to cleanse all of heaven and earth from the contamination of Satan's rebellion from the very beginning as in Leviticus 16, there was the scapegoat which bare the iniquities of the nation upon its head and cast out into the wilderness. Satan becomes that scapegoat of heaven and earth to bear all the sins of creation upon his head because of rebellion cast and, uh, and cast out of heaven into desolate places of hell awaiting final judgment to where he shall be consumed forevermore with all the sins that has ever existed. As in Leviticus 16, there was a fit man required to drive out the scapegoat from the congregation of Israel. Michael the archangel would be the fit man to drive out Satan and his fallen angels from the dominion of heaven, now atoned for by the blood of Jesus Christ, and cast him and cast them down into the dry and desolate places of the wilderness. Leviticus chapter 16 verse 23 And Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation, who be amongst the people, and shall put off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place, and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place, and put on his garments, and come forth, and offer his burnt offering, and a burnt offering of the people, and make atonement for himself and for the people. This is the time when the ram offering, which is the burnt offering, is now offered. Uh, to the uh, offer to the Lord and moving on to the notes that I have here is that after the high priest completes the Yom Kippur Day of Atonement ceremony as prescribed in the law he was to remove the garments of the high priest and put on his own garments and wash himself in water at this point, atonement is made for the whole nation of Israel and cleanse of all transgression. It becomes a time of great jubilee as their iniquity has been atoned for and the sins of the nation has been cast out upon the scapegoat. And this is when they begin to start celebrating and it leads toward the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. And so now we just read in Leviticus 23 how after all is said and done, after the blood offering is offered, right? Now comes the time of the burnt offering of the people, for the people to begin to start presenting their burnt offering. There's a burnt offering of the ram for um, the priest and a burnt offering of, for the people and anything else that the people desire to bring forth in their burnt offering. It's a time of burning, <laughs> pretty much. <clears throat> and it's also a time of celebration leading up to the Feast of Tabernacles because now their sins has been atoned for. When we go to Leviticus 19, we see a similar celebration taking place for the people of God. Because the scapegoat has been cast out, the last piece of the atonement process, and heaven has been atoned for, now there's a time of jubilee and celebration. And this is why, and this is where uh, Re Revelation chapter 19 comes in. And it says, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven, saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders, and the four beasts, fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne saying amen and hallelujah and a 
voice came out of the throne saying praise our god all ye his servants and ye that fear him both small and great and i heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thundering saying hallelujah for the lord god omnipotent reign so this celebration about the burning of Babylon, the judgment being reigned upon Babylon. And we just read in Leviticus chapter 23 how now becomes the time of the burnt offering. So it is a parallel that once the scapegoat is out and judgment is rendered, the burning shall take place and he shall be burned. Babylon and all of his sins and transgressions shall be burned. And now with the time of great rejoicing, the people are preparing themselves for the great wedding supper of the Lamb. The feasting of tabernacles, a time of rejoicing because they have finally been removed from the contamination of corrupted creation. And in verse 7 it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her it was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints, and he saith unto me, uh, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true saints of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven open, and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were a were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he made and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, which were and the armies which were in heaven, followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen white and clean and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with the rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of god and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written king of kings and lord of lords so the reason i bring this up because remember how once the once the priest is done officiating into the holy place of god he was required to take off his priestly garments and put on his garments to help to go and serve and minister to the people the burnt offering and so here we see that after the lord is done making atonement for all of creation he then puts on his kingly robes and in the same way that the priest is required to wash his flesh with water we see that our lord jesus christ has his robes as if it's been dipped in blood which is the wrath of the winepress which is the winepress of the wrath of god this occurred during the time of the burning and also the time of the pouring forth of the seven last plagues which rendered the final judgments upon all mankind so to wrap up this message the notes i have here is in the same way the high priest takes off the priestly garments and put on his own garments and wash himself in water jesus puts off the priestly garments adorn himself in the robes of royalty and wash himself in the great wine press of the wrath of god i already said this but you know i want to tie all loose ends as the people rejoice in the old testament after atonement was made for their sins leading up to the feast of tabernacles Heaven explodes with joyous resounds as they are free from sin forever, getting ready for the tabernacle of God to be amongst the tabernacle of man. Praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome to God's Solar 7 channel. I'm Sister Barbara. I have my husband and my co-host with me. And uh, Dan has a prophecy message he's going to read for you today. Join me in the New King James Version Study Bible. I'm going to be in Exodus 9, chapter 9, uh, verses 22 to... Let's see, to 26. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, and there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, on man, on beast, and on every herb, and the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched out his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire darted to the ground. And the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with hail, so very heavy that there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And the hail struck throughout the whole land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast, and the hail struck every herb of the field and broke every tree of the field. 
Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. So you know what kind of message we have here. I'm glad to be here again on God's Healer 7. I got this word on December 29th of 2012. I am the beginning. I give your life its purpose. I shall make thee whole in my image. Shall the face of truth not remove your indifference to my ways? Those that seek salvation shall find me. Shall the burdens of life not be lifted by my words? Does evil not seek refuge in the darkness? I call on my children now to stand up and raise their hands to my glory. I hear your cries. Your prayers reach my ears. In my hand, I hold the scepter of eternal life. Shall I not speak of your deliverance? Speak, son of man. Speak of the seals of fate. Shall I not bring order from chaos? Have the signs of the end days been revealed in the beginning? Shall the earth not tremble? and the seas boil in these latter days? Shall the plagues on nations not be forthcoming? Shall wickedness not hide its face from me? Shall the sparrow not seek cover from the rain of fire? Many a man's heart will grow cold, and they shall perish from fear. I bear witness to man's many transgressions, and I shall judge him as such. Shall today not find thee in prayer, seeking my forgiveness? The time nears when the door shall close, and none shall enter. Let today find thee in readiness, for I am at the door. Amen. Wow, what a strong message. So here we go. Uh, Shall the plagues on nations not be forthcoming? Then I get it back up. That it says, have the signs of the end days been revealed in the beginning? So as I prayed over this, you could see where it led me right into Exodus, uh, the seventh plague, hail, with the fire and uh, mingled in with it. So let's just review the Exodus plagues. Uh, let's see. Water becomes blood. Then there was frogs, lice, flies. Uh, disease livestock, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, death of the firstborn. Then we go to the end, that was the beginning, now we're in the end, and we have the seals, we have the trumpets, and the bowls. So, look out, here we go, the plagues on the nation shall be forthcoming. So, we want to repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, you can read about that in Acts 238, and again I'm proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord from now until September 23rd, 2015 Yom Kippur. So please come forward. Uh, again, I have some of uh, very disturbing messages up out there about this already. You want to be prepared for the Lord's coming. Thank you, Brother Dan. Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone out there, and enjoy the snow today. Amen. Praise the Lord.